We acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Masonic peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day, with the land and with the water. I uh, walked up this morning through Mystic Vale and the river was crashing through the, um, through the valley there. It's just beautiful. Um, so welcome everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. This is uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, global talks, an opportunity to see all of the exciting work being done uh, at the center and seeing how the projects change over the years as well, taking note of that. Um, I'll say a few introductory welcomes and then I'll turn it over to Jody and Kayla, who um, will have their own comments uh, and introductions to make, and then we'll also be chairing in the proceedings. Um, I'll come back and thank everybody at the end. Um, uh, let me actually thank a few people at the outset. Jody, Kayla, thank you for all that you've done to uh, put all these slides together and bring everybody together and to organize this Zoom meeting. Um, we are very excited to welcome two new faculty fellows. Kristen Brandel, Elizabeth Moore, very much looking forward to, forward to meeting you in the hallways as soon as we can in terms of public health protocols, in terms of personal comfort levels, but very exciting to welcome you to the center. And later on uh, in the term, uh, late February, we'll be welcoming two um, interns, two more interns coming from, <coughs> excuse me, coming from Germany, Pauline Blom and Sonia Welker. So, um, again, uh, another exciting infusion of new people into the uh, into the hall into the into the fellowship program into the center to join what looks from uh, the agenda we have today to already be such an exciting group of scholarship. Uh, Jody, why don't I turn it over to you just for some updates on COVID because I'm sure everybody will have that on, on their mind, and then I'll we'll turn it to Kayla to see us through the projects. Thank you. I just uh, thought I would just use this as a chance. Thanks, Martin, for um, giving me a couple minutes here. I just I give a chance as I sent him email out on Monday, just to let you know kind of where the center's at for this month. Um, basically, with the global talks, we'll just do them online. I know we were hoping to do them more in person a bit yet, but we'll wait until we have some guidance from the PHO. Um, and then just coming from uh, UVIX guidelines, just making sure you know that all the uh, social events for employees and students, they just have to be canceled for this month um, and or else you can do them virtually, which we're also adept at now. And then just to conduct your meetings online where possible. Um, that's what we are sort of doing as a CFGS team. We won't be hosting any large public events until we hear differently from the PHO. They'll all be or if we do, they'll be online. And lastly, we're just for the next two weeks until um, UVic is opening, we're kind of um, mirroring our schedule with the January 24th opening of classes. The um, our staff is rotating um, in person, so we'll make sure there's somebody in the office for um, our events or for, uh, you know, make sure that the uh, printer's working and that supplies and mail are coming and all of that. But it's a pretty empty uh, university. so. We're just going to do our rotating um, and online. So if there, but if there's a specific time, there's a couple of times that there may be a bit of a crossover. So if there's a specific time that you need someone, um, you can email Kayla at cfgs at uvic.ca and she can make sure that there's somebody in the office. Um, but there is that notice that's online at uvic. You can use it as guidance. Um, we kind of, Kayla and I scan frequently just to make sure if there's any updates that we, we get them as soon as possible. Um, yeah, that's it for me on that one. And I'm going to turn it over to Kayla because she's got some stuff that she's working on um, for upcoming events. Over to you, Kayla. Okay. Um, so for Global Talks, as Jody just said, they're going to be virtual, but we are recording them and uploading them to YouTube as per usual. Um, we do have our January slots filled. So today we have Project Showcase, and then we have Katrina and Deborah. We actually have an open slot on February 2nd, if anybody wanted to fill that. We're still looking to fill that one. And then February, we have reading break. And then we also have some more slots in March and April, um, just so everybody is aware of that. And then we also have a few upcoming online events. We have uh, Past Wrongs, Future Choices, Japanese Diaspora in Brazil during World War II period. That's on January 18th from 1 p.m. to 2.30. And then on the 19th, we have um, 
a talk animals and society, landscapes of death, political violence beyond the human in the Andes. Um, that will be online as well. I believe that one is at noon. All this information is also on our events page and I just updated that this morning. And then on the 28th, we have our another talk from our property and dispossession series to share not surrender with Peter Cook and Neil Valance. And that is at one o'clock to 2.30. Again, that's on the events page as well. So you can find the Zoom links there and they will also be in the on tap that's coming out on Friday. And then looking forward, we're still figuring out some things for February, but March 22nd, World Water Day, slowly starting to plan for that. Obviously there's some things to consider with online versus hybrid, but hopefully some more updates to come. But yeah, that's what's coming up. Oops. So just before we jump right into this, Stephanie, I just wanted to say um, it's one of the reasons we decided to do this project showcase is came from a lot of the feedback of the fellows and the projects about um, who's in the halls. So right now you would all be in the halls day to day and you would be bouncing into each other and you could ask questions about who's who and what you're working on. But also this is a little bit of a chance to have a, a slightly deeper dive of your of the uh, project's elevator pitches so that um, you know, one of the things the center really likes to do is to pull our um, people together and networking and get to know each other. So um, this is a chance for our projects. We have, the, these are kind of the ones that have been longer term in the office. Of course, we have some upcoming ones and, have, and everyone has a research project at the center really. So um, wanting to make sure that uh, these ones are just the ones that you would see in the halls with the plaques on them, but there's so much important research that's done and we hope to get individual researchers on there um, to talk about their projects later in the term. Uh, so for today, basically the overview will go through each project. There's a um, representative from each one and you have about 10 minutes to present. We have most of the slides. Uh, Kayla's going to control the deck and just make sure that we, we move along. And I may get a little bit antsy and um, push you as uh, we'll save all the questions to the very end, just so we can make sure everybody gets heard. And um, yeah, I think that's that's it for now. I think we have about six or seven presentations. And the first one, um, I think Stephanie, you're presenting for big. Did you want to jump in? Perfect. Just for the record, we don't have to do these alphabetically every year. Just now that I'm with a center that starts with B, we can switch it up if we needed to. Um, but no, I'm I don't know if Manuel's in yet, but uh, I'll be representing the big um, program I here. Um, so Emmanuel, you can cut me off if you want to add anything. Um, did you want to go to the next slide, Kayla? So I just wanted to start with a brief overview of who you would normally see in the halls if we were in the halls. So our core UVic team is comprised of our admin staff, formal fellows, student researchers, and some contract workers. So um, we have our core project administration, which is Emmanuel, Jeff, and myself. And then we have um, Ben and Michael, who are postdocs. Um, Jules and Shukia and Maria, who are PhD fellows with us. Um, Charlotte, who's an undergrad or communications assistant. Julia, an undergrad RA. And Kazra is one of our contractors. He's built our databases for us. Um, we also have a couple governance positions, but our um, advisory board chairs won't, they're not at UVic, so you would very rarely see them in our hallways. Um, we are currently advertising for five new fellowships starting next year. So the hope would be that by next year, we have two more undergrad fellows, two more MAs and a PhD. Um, Kayla, next slide. Um, so what do we do? Um, the 21st Century Borders Grant builds off of our original big grants. So whereas big sought to understand the changing nature of borders using six themes to document how state-centered and territorial fixed research limits our understanding of borders, um, this new grant takes that and takes it a step further in hopes of exploring and advancing the required shift from that state-centric model to a more mobile logic that focuses on internal and external forces that challenge this territorial integrity of the state. Um, so we have two main research pillars, one led by Jeff, one led by Emmanuel. 
So pillar one um, looks inside of states at how indigenous awareness and resurgence, along with increasing prevalent politics of nationhood and nationalism, will affect, fragment, and redraft intergovernmental relations. So there's a growing body of literature that examines indig indigenous nationhood claims, and another separate body of literature that looks at regionalist and national claims, and particularly within Europe for the context of this project. Um, so one of the goals of this pillar is to bridge the gap between these two literatures and explore how claims of nationhood and nationalist claims are similar, how they're different, and how they factor into calls for self-determination. So the work we're going to do in this pillar will examine the ways that Indigenous nations, communities, and people challenge the territoriality of states and other patriarchal institutions in order to generate new understandings of how Indigenous relationships develop and persist beyond these territorial boundaries. And so that pillar is led by Jeff and a team of Indigenous scholars here at UBIC. And then pillar two, if pillar one is looking at issues of territory and nationalism, pillar two focuses more on connectivity and integration. So pillar two will examine the relationships between bordering processes and states' territoriality. So um, this looks at identifying and examining instruments and infrastructures of co connectivity and some proposed um, research programs will include looking at um, structures, regulations, and functions of borders um, in issues such as pre-border clearance mechanisms, state-to-state -state security agreements, international border management regimes, so really focusing on that human mobility or trade flow aspect of our relationship with borders. And so um, these two pillars are kind of cross-sectioned by two overarching themes, which you can see is kind of a node to our original six themes of the big grant. Um, so we will have people focusing within each theme on issues of ecology and security and hoping to use these themes to cross-sect and connect the two pillars. Um, and we'll also have partners working on country-specific case studies. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, so more in, like more tangibly, what do we do? Um, so we have funding for student grants. Over the course of our seven years, we're hoping to train 15 undergrads, 107 MAs, eight PhDs, and eight postdocs. Um, we have money for student travel grants. We have a number of uh, policy partners who host annual conferences. So we will be tentatively sending students um, and team members to a total of 44 conferences over the seven years. We host summer institutes at UVic, um, where we will have custom officials, students coming together to learn um, from a variety of specialists we bring in. We'll have two per year. Um, we have two international conferences planned, one in Victoria, one in Ottawa. We have a number of workshops hosted by partner universities. Emmanuel is working on developing a online course. We have the big database, big and John Monet database projects, uh, where we have additional funding to train students and create um, a comprehensive database on borders. And then we have a number of publications. So in addition to our partnerships with the University of Ottawa Press and NPRI Books, who will host some of our more major book publications over the next seven years. We also have our own peer reviewed open access journal, The Big Review, which is managed internally by Michael Carpenter. Uh, we also have a book series and we have plans for special issues in a number of other journals, including the Journal for Borderlands Studies. Um, we're currently working on redoing our website. We have our social media, a quarterly e-newsletter, which we're launching this month. So it's a little busy. Um, Thank you, Kayla. <laughs> um, so where are our partners? We have expanded from our previous grant. So we have new scholars and partners in Asia, South Asia, Latin America, and North Africa. Um, some of these are co-applicants. So we have co-applicants in India, we have co-applicants in Japan and Brazil, and then we have collaborators around the world as well. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so kind of here's an overview of our full network. Um, so not only have we expanded our geographical scope this year, but we've also added a number of new policy um, organizations that will help us bridge that policy academia gap. 
Uh, so we have brought on the World's Customs Organization. We've brought on the CBSA. Um, we have a number of partners in Europe that do border region research as well. And then we have, of course, our UBIC partners and our university co-applicants around, mostly in Canada, but a few international as well. Um, and again, I'm going very quickly because I am keeping an eye on the time. So if you have questions, you can also send them to me. Um, and then finally, our funding sources primarily were funded through a SHRC partnership grant, seven years. Uh, we also have a Jean Monnet network, which is for our database. Emmanuel holds a Jean Monnet chair. We have the Center for Excellence, and then we have a Jean Monnet project. And these tend to run um, in about three year increments. So um, we have most of that funding through till 2023. We're also partners on a couple other Jean Monnet networks, which we will use to host conferences and workshops here at UVic as well. Um, but this is also subject to change as we're constantly seeking out additional revenue sources. Um, but yeah, that's big in a very quick, very, very quick nutshell. If you guys have any questions, we're happy to answer. Well done, Stephanie. Everything you do in 10 minutes. So you all can see that we just need to, um, it's, a, it's a trick to try to get everything they do in 10 minutes, but it's a good way just to get a high level overview. And then later on in the term, um, our researchers will be able to prevent, present. So next on the list, we have the UCANET project, uh, your European Memories project. And I think Fazil and Matt, you will be presenting with us today. Yes, Jody, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you for being here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, um, so <laughs> I'm here uh, as a PhD student at uh, UVic PoliSci and a research assistant for uh, two of UCANET's projects uh, this uh, year. And um, in this year's project presentations, I'm filling in for Beate Schmidtke, uh, who is the co-lead and manager of UCANET projects. And because she's in Europe, um, I'm here um, to present uh, the 2021 projects for UCANET. And uh, I'm uh, very happy about it. So uh, thank you so much. So um, the um, image that you see in your uh, screens is uh, UCANET's homepage. Uh, it's a um, website that has been uh, renewed and relaunched in 2021, and um, you can check it out here at uh, ucanet.org. Um, whereas um, in my second slide, um, thank you, Kayla. <laughs> um, it's uh, just an overview of um, the uh, sections that I'm uh, going to present today. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, for those who might not be familiar with UCANET's work, um, I'd like to say that um, UCANET is an outreach and networking initiative uh, for scholars working on issues uh, related to Europe from a comparative perspective, and it's currently focusing on democracy, populism, and European memory politics. Uh, the aim uh, of this project is to foster uh, the Canada-Europe transatlantic dialogue, uh, among scholars, policymakers, and uh, civil society. Um, so uh, UCANET is hosted at the Center for Global Studies since 2018, and it's a collaborative initiative uh, with experts from Canada and Europe. Um, here you can see uh, some of the names that have been collaborating with us um, in the past years, uh, both from uh, the CFGS and uh, from uh, UVic scholars, uh, scholars from different universities in Canada, as well as um, universities in Europe. Um, this is also a project that is co-financed uh, by the Erasmus Plus program and the European Commission, uh, the Schurk Fund and the Konrad Adenauer, Adenauer um, um, Stiftung in Ottawa. Um, so um, what I'm going to um, just briefly introduce today is, um, first of all, the main components of the UCANET and the UCANET uh, website, overview of the two main projects that we're running currently, uh, the project goals and the recent success and upcoming opportunities. Um, as for uh, the main components uh, of UCANET, um, in, these include, um, uh, first of all, uh, a very extensive uh, database, um, an experts database, um, which currently accounts for over 300 active profiles. Um, 
it's important to highlight that this is a free access tool that might be useful for uh, young and senior scholars wanting to look for uh, other academics uh, searching for their topic of interest, fields of expertise, or their universities. Um, another important component of UCANET uh, concerns organizing uh, transatlantic conferences, webinars, um, as well as producing video interviews, uh, educational resources, and um, academic and uh, project-related publications, uh, and offering uh, media outreach initiatives uh, for scholars. Um, UCANET's outreach uh, platforms um, include a new website, as I mentioned, uh, since 2021, uh, which comprises uh, also a blog section and a YouTube channel, Twitter and Facebook accounts. And uh, this leads me, thank you very much, Kayla, to um, our first project, uh, which um, is uh, the European Memory Politics Project, which has started in 2019 and it's going to continue until 2023. Um, this project um, basically brings together scholars from Canada and European countries and uh, it explores how the 20th century past is uh, reinterpreted, commemorated and narrativized in contemporary political life. Um, the project delves into the issues of populism, nationalism and the challenges posed by this phenomena to the European memory culture. And uh, at the same time, it aims to offer um, European and North American perspectives on commemorating and addressing past injustices. So um, it is uh, co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union and supported um, by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Ottawa. Um, as for um, more concretely, the project goals uh, of the European Memory Politics Project, uh, first of all, is um, um, to produce um, um, it's the previous um, slide, please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's basically to produce and publish um, innovative uh, scholarly research on issues um, related to memory politics in Europe, connect with students, scholars and practitioners over questions emerging from shared interest in political contestations and narrativizations of memory, identity and community. And finally, uh, build a transatlantic uh, interdisciplinary network of scholars contributing uh, to critical conversations on uh, memory politics. And um, this brings me to the next um, slide uh, about the, our recent success. Um, the previous one, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, so um, I'd like to mention four project research findings on memory politics um, on um, the cases of Hungary, Poland, Germany, and France that we have uh, published, uh, and they're available as PDF uh, files um, on the UCANET website. Uh, we have also carried out six webinars on memory politics in Europe and Canada. Uh, these are also available on the website and on the UCANET's uh, YouTube channel. And uh, finally, um, there has been a three-day face-to-face workshop with network partners uh, at the Hamburg uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, which was held in October 2021. And uh, this was a um, very important meeting to discuss the comparative country studies on memory politics and uh, prepare the next uh, conferences and uh, workshops uh, in the 2022 and 2023. Um, so um, this brings us to upcoming opportunities as uh, with regards to European memory politics. Um, the first one, and I'm very happy <laughs> to announce that um, we're going to publish very soon a digital brochure and a video on memory politics uh, dedicated to high school students and first year university students as well. Uh, we're also going to uh, publish very soon a video series. Uh, these are interviews with experts on memory politics. And um, um, also, um, we have a list of conferences uh, planned for uh, next year, uh, but um, naturally the project had to adapt to the challenges posed to the COVID pandemic, uh, which also meant that we had to postpone our field schools and conferences in Europe. Uh, so um, our network's current dates uh, for the upcoming conferences and workshops, uh, as it is now, is uh, France in uh, March 2022, uh, Poland in May 2022, um, and a conference at UVIC uh, in October 2022, and Hungary in May 2023. And this uh, leads me to uh, our second project, uh, Democracy and Populism. Uh, whose um, extensive name, in fact, is uh, Democracy and Populism, Populism and its Effect on Liberal Democracy. This is a, a Shuk-funded uh, project that has started uh, in 2019. It's going to uh, 
uh, continue until 2024. Um, and it's a project that builds uh, on the assumption that populism uh, has developed into a veritable challenge in Western European uh, liberal democracies. And uh, it thus explores uh, questions of how right populist uh, parties claim to represent the voice of the people and express uh, popular sovereignty and how right-wing populism when in power affects minority rights. Um, the project builds on the synergies created with another recent project, the uh, Europe-Canada Dialogue on Democracy, um, Democratic Deficit and the Rise of Populism, uh, which was co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union, the Center for Global Studies, uh, the Faculty of Law and the Cedar, uh, Cedar Trees Institute uh, at the University of Victoria. Um, as for uh, the concrete project goals of the Democracy and Populism project, um, um, I'd like to mention, uh, first of all, that uh, we aim to foster debates uh, open to public through public lectures, webinars, social media. Um, secondly, contribute to students' education uh, by creating a new uh, graduate level class for students at UVic and uh, produce publications, including books, journal articles and special uh, journal issues. And finally, uh, to contribute to policy development through a high uh, profile public forum in Ottawa. Um, and finally, um, regarding recent success and upcoming opportunities, um, there are um, three things that I would like to mention here. Uh, the first one is a special issue uh, of the journal Social uh, and Legal Studies to be published in early 2023. Uh, this is a special issue that is based on a 2020 conference on populism in the age of constitutionalism with uh, UVic law professor Jeremy Weber. Um, the second one is uh, also based on a 2019 uh, conference, uh, Democracy and its Future. Um, and uh, it's a book uh, which bears the title of Democratic Multiplicity, Democracies and Their Futures, uh, which is in print with Cambridge University Press. And uh, finally, um, there has been a publication of Schmidt's Schmidt uh, article uh, with the people, Demarcating the Demos in Populist Mobilization, the case of the Italian Lega, uh, published on MDPI's uh, Social Sciences in uh, September 2021 issue. Um, so um, this is all uh, for me now. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your questions and um, discuss more further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fazila. That's a, a lot to say in 10 minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. That was great. Um, so now we have um, Christina and Elena. It's nice to see your face again, Elena. Welcome, welcome back. I don't know which one of you are jumping in, but I'll just, I'll turn it over to you with the uh, European Hi. studies. Hi. Hello all, nice to be back. <laughs> I still, I feel totally rusty a little bit still from being on leave and, um, but it's wonderful to be back. And I think uh, Christina will do a little bit of a tag team. And um, I want to begin by, by even though Nina is not here, I, I want to just begin by acknowledging what a wonderful job Nina did as, as acting director, um, uh, 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 keeping the program running uh, in a really, really wonderful way. Um, so uh, unlike all the other projects, uh, right, uh, we are not a research uh, project, but we are actually an academic program. Um, and um, I'm not sure, uh, do, Jody, would you like me to talk about uh, kind of the intricacies of the, of, the, of the program or just sort of provide a kind of an update of what has been sort of happening? Just a just a quick overview would be great. And then the thing with the research center is really that you have the two parts, the program, but also that a lot of it is the the, um, the research side. Yeah. And Got thank it. you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so the reason why we are we are actually part of CFGS is because unlike uh, pretty much every other academic program on campus, um, uh, we are we are kind of uh, we are much closer linked to research that's going on um, in European studies. Um, the university likes to separate, you know, research and teaching sort of institutions or structures, and we are very much intertwined um, with with uh, EU research research and, and uh, uh, are supported by, by um, some of our activities are supported obviously by research grants that come from the European Union Jean Monnet uh, Center of Excellence. Um, so um, 
so in terms of our uh, where the program is standing, um, how we're doing, um, the program is doing really well, actually. Um, our our courses are very well enrolled. Um, it's a pretty, pretty uh, dynamic and vibrant program. We just uh, restarted again um, the student club, the, the uh, EUS student club, and um, there was uh, a lot of uh, excited, interested feedback from students students so so they're going to start their activities again um, this January like starting from now and hopefully uh, restart also uh, activities that they've had before such as the undergraduate um, uh, 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 journal in European studies um, apart from sort of our courses that we're teaching um, I think the most important um, other uh, 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 activities to report on are the West Coast Model EU and the EU Study Tour, uh, which, um, you know, given the pandemic, uh, have been um, challenging to, 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 to uphold. So the West Coast Model EU last year was uh, online, and this year it's going to be in person. We have a student team lined up, and we're just trying to figure out um, if we can let them go. <laughs> <laughs> to Seattle to participate in the West Coast Model EU. Um, but um, uh, Nina and uh, Christina did a really great um, advertising blitz in, in October and November to generate a lot of uh, student excitement around our experiential learning uh, programs. And, and so we have, we have a team together and we'll see what's going to happen. Um, the EU study tour, which is this, this other big showcase piece, uh, just just to, to uh, uh, tell you what that is about, the EU study tour is a field school um, in the European Union, right? So the students travel, um, they, they, um, they, they, they go to the different institutions that are key for the European Union, um, they, they participate in talks, they do learning, and then attached after the, the, the field school component are um, internships that, that students um, can take and are guaranteed if they are, uh, uh, if they have participated in the EU study tour. So, um, so the last two years uh, EU study tour was suspended because of the pandemic. And this year began so wonderfully, right? It was the age of Delta, not Omicron. So we were planning, we were planning um, to go uh, to, to restart the, the, the study tour as it used to be uh, pre-pandemic. Um, Nina and Christina did a whole bunch of advertising, generated interest. Uh, we've been um, talking with the other uh, partner universities uh, who are part of the EU study tour network. So we were all coordinating activities and then Omicron happened. And so where we're at right now with that is um, we don't want to let go of the study tour. <laughs> Uh, we don't want to have another year of hiatus. So what we're exploring uh, at the moment are, um, well, what can we do? Is there is there uh, uh, is there a possibility of of um, retaining the internships because that's a longer duration activity for the students, right? So they can travel for six weeks and do the internships and have sort of a, a kind of an online study tour uh, to prepare them for the internships. So right now. Now, um, we are in the planning process, in the in the pivoting or de-pivoting, re-pivoting process. Um, uh, but our our uh, plan is very much to to try and see if we can salvage a um, uh, 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 kind of a very meaningful um, experiential learning component for the students, regardless of where the pandemic is going to be <laughs> in the next few months. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. So there's there's a lot of excitement, a lot of dynamism in the program, but also um, a few, a few uh, uh, question marks about um, uh, the student travel that is associated with our program. Um, I think, uh, Christina, I'll give you an opportunity maybe to, to unmute and, and fill in from your perspective, uh, sort of how the last sort of half year has been, um, and, and, and if there's anything that I've missed. And please take credit for all the work that was done last year, this uh, last half year. Uh, I was on leave, so so please, uh, please take the chance. Okay, well, thanks, Elena. Um, as Elena mentioned, we've had some 
staffing changes and, um, you know, many uncertainties with the pandemic. Um, so it's been, um, I just, I just joined the program in uh, September. And again, I would also like to thank Nina for her guidance. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite a learning curve, but um, it's exciting. Lots of, um, lots of really um, interesting aspects to this program. And um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, yeah, we, uh, I guess the, the word to describe my job is pivoting. So we, um, we got the approval from the university to go ahead and plan um, for the study tour and the West Coast Model EU in I think October, something like that where normally we would have a much longer ramp up. So we had this very exciting flurry of activity. We were visiting classes, um, et cetera, got a lot of students excited about it and then Omicron hit. And so as Elena mentioned, um, even just as of yesterday, um, we've been meeting with the network to kind of decide on what the next steps will be for the program. So. I'm hopeful, I'm always much more optimistic than I probably should be about things, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, um, to have some type of experience for the students this year. Um, yeah, not a whole lot else to um, report that Elena didn't cover. Um, things are really in flux, but you know, it's exciting. There's um, the student course union is just as of this week, getting up and running. So we'll be focusing on that and drumming up a lot of excitement for the program amongst students. And we'll just see what the next few months bring, I suppose. Um, I guess I should mention also um, briefly the um, Jamonet Center of Excellence um, that uh, partially funds my position as well as the study tour, one of our courses. Um, a bunch of other things uh, was, um, you know, we have a lot of funding left on the table from, from the, uh, the student travel aspect of the grant um, since we've not been able to use it. And so we're looking into extending, hopefully, the grant so that um, funding's available uh, for next year, hopefully. Um, so again, lots of things in flux, um, but but it's exciting. I'm, I'm happy to be here and glad to be working with Elena now. And um, it's almost like I have a new boss at my new job. So, um, but yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you both. Wow, what tricky times trying to get, especially with so much dedicated to student mobility. Be interesting to see what the next couple of months hold. Yeah, <laughs> your job definitely has been pivoting, Christina, pivoting. for sure. Yeah, pivoting. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. So um, up next, we have, I think Patrick's here um, on the TriChair in Early Childhood Education. It's the UNESCO TriChair. I think Ellen was having a little bit of um, challenges with the computer. Uh, Patrick, are you around? Yep. I'm, oh, perfect. I'm Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Welcome. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just, oh, there's Ellen. Oh, there you go. Good. Look at that. So we're all here. <laughs> Wonderful. Way to go, everybody. There you go. I'll defer to you, Alan. Please proceed. Um, yes, I was able to get some of the computer problems addressed, uh, Jordy. So uh, thank you for that. And, and um, Patrick was uh, indicating he was going to be able to join as well. So that's, that's uh, great. The major focus, the UNESCO uh, Chairs for Early Childhood Education, Care, and Development, have a uh, Africa focus, and that goes back to work that started back in the mid 90s. And uh, the UNESCO chair was launched in 2008. It went to uh, two chair structure in the mid 2010s, and then most recently a uh, three chair um, structure in um, uh, just this last uh, couple of years. The major focus, uh, and I think that Patrick actually provided an update on this at a, a recent, maybe December session, the major work they've been working on has been development of an ECD in Africa volume. Um, and a key element of that is uh, establishing some of the history of ECD development uh, in Africa. And that's a key area for both uh, Patrick and myself. Patrick's one of the co-editors 
Uh, with that, I'm one of the co-editors, uh, Hasina Ebrahim in South Africa and Umar Bari in uh, Senegal. Uh, those are the other two UNESCO chairs, co-chairs, and they uh, are also editors you know, with this volume. So that's been taking up a lot of our time over the last year, pulling that together. It has uh, we have 43 different uh, authors, uh, 15 chapters, eight country uh, stories, reports on ECD development in those various countries. So it's quite a, a large uh, undertaking and it's um, quite a lot of work to um, you know, shepherd it through the process. We're getting closer to uh, having it um, completed within the next month or so should have it in position to uh, send to UNESCO. And uh, it ties into a key initiative that UNESCO has regarding early childhood education, care and development, which is the um, Global Partnership Strategy, GPS. And um, the, what they're proposing is that it be part of a launch at a conference that will take place later, later in the year that relates to the GPS. So those are the, the major points. I don't know, uh, Patrick, uh, again, Patrick's one of the uh, co-editors with that. If you wanted to add anything to that, it's been basically just uh, you know, shoulder to the wheel uh, moving this um, project forward for the last many months. But Patrick, did you wish to add anything? Um, um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Alan, for for that update. I think um, again, you know, as co-editor, as part of you know, sort of the focus is to sort of as we've been going through the pandemic, um, how do we sort of you know what are the forty three authors looking forward to post you know the pandemic? How are we moving forward? Um, and you know, in concert with you know the recently launched um, global partnership strategy uh, for early childhood development that was launched by UNESCO on the sixth of December, uh, looking at how we can infuse our work as you know ECC practitioners uh, around you know in Africa, uh, infuse that into the global partnership and how we can build you know so forward better, um, and so sort of seeing COVID um, as 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 not 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 you know seeing the end of COVID not as an ending but you know as a beginning uh, of uh, work that uh, has been you know happening in Africa um and i think the exciting thing also with this project um and with this book project really has been you know the bringing together of you know anglophone uh, speaking uh, you know africa and francophone speaking africa um largely because um for a long time um ECD in africa has sort of you know progressed so well uh within the anglophone speaking so the english speaking africa uh, has had great trajectory and movement um and less has been known about the work uh, that has happened within the early childhood development uh, sector in Francophone Africa. And so I've been excited uh, to work in partnership with the UNESCO Tri-Chair, one of the you know, Tri-Chairs, uh, Professor Uma Barre, uh, who brings in such a wealth of knowledge around Francophone Africa. And so this material that has not been previously available is going to be available through this volume, through this book uh, for ECD, uh, and that's early childhood development practitioners, uh, not only in Africa, but, you know, uh, around the world as well, to sort of see how Africa has been moving forward when it comes to implementation uh, of programs uh, that set children up for, for, for uh, lifelong learning. Um, so that's been great uh, to be involved in that. Um, and then I think, you know, the last point I would like to make is around the historical process that, you know, part of my uh, journey uh, as a scholar too, you know, having sort of um, graduated with my, you know, PhD uh, last April, was to look back into the history uh, of early childhood development in Africa, uh, particularly having a lens on what we call early childhood development networks, as well as sort of international conference, African international conferences uh, that, you know, UVIC uh, through Alan Pence played a huge part uh, in, in, in holding in Africa and how those, you know, influenced uh, the growth of the sector in Africa. Um, and importantly for me, being able uh, to document, uh, you know, that process uh, as a self-confessed uh, millennial, right, <laughs> providing that aspect uh, for my generation and those generations to come to be able to trace back, you know, the foundations of uh, early childhood development, you know, building up on our sort of Afrocentric uh, and indigenous uh, sort of knowledge base and how we can use that 
again, uh, using the GPA sort of uh, language, how we can use that indigenous language, I mean, the indigenous learning, uh, the Afrocentric perspectives, how we can use that to build forward better. Uh, uh, as we as we look to a world uh, beyond uh, beyond COVID, so just the historical part, doing the analysis analysis interviews, um, and um, really working through with uh, colleagues around Africa has been uh, very transformative for me. Um, appreciating the work uh, that um, those that have gone ahead, you know, of us have, have done within the ECD sector. So, yeah, that's just um, a short sort of update from me. Thank you, Alan and Patrick. Um, that's great. I appreciate the the build back better, Patrick. That's really that's really uh, poignant for now. Um, and also maybe that something that this tri chair was a huge move this year to bring that Frank francophone community in. Um, so next up, we have um, our second of the, uh, the UNESCO chairs, which is just really unique at the university to have these the, both of them sitting here and then both in the center, which has been a really wonderful process to bring them through our halls now. Um, so I think Maeva, you're going to uh, jump in and, and present for the um, co-chair in community-based re um, research. Yes, I'm happy to present today, but uh, couldn't join this morning, uh, but uh, I'm really happy to share some of our uh, initiatives. And um, it's been, uh, I joined the UNESCO chair to help uh, with projects with BUD in April. So it's been al already almost uh, 10 months. So it's been, uh, it's been great. I, I've been uh, loving all the diversity of projects and the, all the international collaborations happening. So, uh, um, so the co-chair is held by uh, Dr. Rajesh Tandon in, uh, in, in Delhi, India, and um, Bud Hall here at UVic. Uh, if you could do, go to the next slide, please. So the, the structure is, uh, is interesting. So it's uh, an agreement between uh, UVic, uh, the Secretary General of UNESCO in Paris, and as well as um, PRIA, Participatory Research in Asia, um, in Delhi, India. So uh, the, the chair started in uh, 20, uh, 2012, yes. And uh, so uh, co-chair, as I mentioned, is uh, Bud Hall and Rajesh Tandon, uh, but it's also um, uh, diversity of team members I will show you on the next slide. Um, and then there's also links with the different faculties at UVic, so the human and social development, social sciences, and continuing studies. And uh, we report to the UNESCO Higher Education Division in Paris, which they were just visiting in person in November. Um, so this is uh, part of the team. Um, here at UVic, we've got uh, also Dr. Walter Lepore and um, he just got a professor position also in public admin, so that's great. He's uh, been involved a lot with uh, one of the initiatives on um, related to the Knowledge for Change hubs and some of the um, research um, findings around that. Uh, Siriani is uh, also part of the CFGS and uh, some of us were at the Christmas dinner, so she was there as well. So Siriani uh, is the coordinator for the Knowledge for Change hub. And, um, on the um, Delhi side, we've got, um, I'm in touch regularly with uh, Niharika, who works closely with Rajesh. And uh, Sumitra is the publication coordinator. There was just a, a book um, released last spring on, um, on uh, higher education, socially responsible higher education. So that's an open access book. So she was the lead on that. And we uh, recently had uh, Barbara Jenny joining us as well um, at UBIC. So, it's a, it's a great dynamic team for sure. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, the big goals or mandate for the UNESCO chair in uh, social responsibility, uh, community-based research and social responsibility in higher education is to really help build research capacity and, um, and just kind of extend the community-based research, participatory research aspects. And um, so it's more accessible for people to um, access training and also uh, training resources so they can train their own community members and community researchers. And the focus is on Global South and Excluded North as well. So we've been working with the Arctic partners as well. Um, the, also, the goal is to, to contribute to international policy making uh, in 
that field. So that means in integrating new languages in UNESCO language, for example. So there's been some recommendations to UNESCO related to um, decolonization of knowledge, you know, uh, including diversity of knowledges within uh, the academic world. So lots of uh, um, great field that are in a way related to my PhD, but at a uh, 30,000 feet level, I would say. So it's, I found it, uh, I find it super interesting. Um, and so it's all in the support of uh, also the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of our current initiatives are uh, the Knowledge for Change Global Consortium, which is the K4C hubs. So Knowledge for Change is um, helping community researchers and um, community members that are interested in community-based research to take this training program. And then they can train their own um, community researchers uh, in their communities that they work with. And uh, there's about 28 now, I believe. We have 22 on this slide, but I think we're almost at 28 now in the world. So there's a map on the website uh, that I can post. And um, there's also a, a recent report that was just released that I can share about the Knowledge for Change hubs. Um, we have this short project, which is called Bridging Knowledge Cultures. And uh, Walter is the lead on that. And Barbara is also involved. And it's, uh, it's about kind of from all these hubs around the world, what are some of the findings? What are some of the challenges, some of the findings that they find uh, they found through this process? Uh, we have the World Higher Education Conference coming up in May 2022 in Barcelona. So we're ramping up towards that. Hopefully it's still going to happen. It was postponed. Um, we are uh, preparing some short reports. We had consultations. Uh, so those consultations in uh, related to higher education will be uh, part of the submissions that we do for the conference. And uh, we are also have a, a number of events that we want to do during the conference as, and as side events in Barcelona. So we're um, in the preparation for that. Um, in terms of uh, UNESCO recommendations, uh, I, I was aware of some reports that uh, Bud and the team have been working on around open science and decolonization of knowledge. So some of that language has been really um, accepted within UNESCO um, type of language. So it's a great, it's a great next step in the, um, in the inclusion of diversity of knowledge. Uh, there is an upcoming talk coming up. So I know that uh, um, Bud and Rajesh has been uh, working hard on the lecture coming up for Martin Luther King Day on Monday, January 17. It's going to be at 8 a.m. or time, Pacific time. Uh, it's a Gandhi King lecture on international relations and peace studies. So I'll make sure to post the link in the chat. And um, there's been a recent meeting that I think um, Judy and Martin were part of as well recently with uh, Alfonso Reyes Alvarez. Do. He's the rector of University uh, of Ibagué in Colombia. And so there's been some um, uh, potential synergies with the Knowledge for Change hub. He, he's very interested in, in getting that um, more in place in his, uh, at his university. There's lots of interest for community-based research, so that's great. So that's, um, I think that's it for me for today. Feel free to reach out if you're interested in participatory research, community-based research. Always happy to um, to have people join our meetings and our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mava. I can't believe it's almost been a year since you've been with. Uh... I know. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Time warp. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Um, but also, the one things I'm noticing is the slides are coming up to the really broad networks that everyone has, and I love when yeah. I see your slides, but also your commitment that you're working across borders constantly. And um, I know that a lot of your meetings are happening at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and <laughs> sometimes <laughs> very robust yeah. partnerships. But yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your update. Thank you. I think next up we have uh, Polis and I believe Oliver Brandes is presenting today and I'm sure um, the team will jump in as needed. Hi everybody, um, Oliver Brandis here. I think my camera should be up. Um, I am coming to you from the mouth of the Colquitts on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Masonic's community. And uh, as all things Polis, we uh, employ a team approach. And uh, so I'll start 
things off with just uh, reminding us that we're the Polis Project on Ecological Governance. We are a university-based think and do tank, the do being very important, where we try and blend the academic and the practical policy and law reform aspects as we advance sustainability around both government community action. So the action aspect is uh, very important. Uh, next slide, we'll give you the overview um, of what we'll just uh, briefly chat about. I'll give you the Polis uh, Project 101, some of the philosophy and the underpinning thinking, and then some of the current initiatives as with all the projects today, of course, we could share many more, but um, uh, for, for today, we'll just give you a sampling, a little buffet sampling. And the next slide will give you the ecological governance thinking. So this is the philosophy or the grounding of the project. This goes all the way back to our early days when we were part of the Eco Research Chair and our principal and founder, uh, Michael McGonigal, laid out some of the ideas, which was that ecology needs to be embedded in all levels of decision making. So the idea that the environment is not just a sector like, um, I don't know, uh, mining, fishing, environment, um, but instead that it's something that cross cuts and integrates. And then we're driven by a couple of very important uh, considerations. We ask how we might foster circular systems. Nature operates only in circular systems. How do we bring our social or human systems so that we reduce those demands and um, impacts on distant and local ecosystems? And one of the sort of cross-cutting sort of core pieces that we always think about is what does governance shape by the principles of ecological sustainability look like? And I can tell you that it looks very different than many of the things that we're used to in today's world. And certainly this year that we've lived through, um, not just from a pandemic perspective, but from all the disasters and challenges, whether we're talking drought, floods, fires, the sort of feeling of this impending apocalypse um, really tells us a lot of the choices and decisions that we as society are making, maybe we need to revisit. And the next slide sort of is my visual representation of the various aspects where I think Polis and especially the water project as one aspect of Polis spends a bit of its time. And governance, policy and law are the things that we want to reform, but ethics is that superstructure that it exists within, the relational aspects of how we live and how we are together. And when I think about policy, I think about the direction. So where are we headed? So sometimes it's as simple as what is the provincial or local government or national policy on something. And the law, of course, deals with the rules. How, what are the consequences? What happens when we do or don't do something? But when we think about law in the broader societal aspect, it becomes much more about how we live together and how we are together. And that's where the ethics and the governance aspects really begin to shine. And when I think about governance, and certainly from the Water Project, we think about governance in a very, um, uh, how, like a cockpit. It's not just about where are we headed, it's not just about the rules, but how are we going to get there? So where are the decisions, where are we going to make our choices um, right now, where the operational and the management interlink with some of these broader uh, pieces. <clears throat> and the next slide, we'll talk a bit about what the Water Project specifically does like so many of the projects here at the Center for Global Studies, we try and cross cut. So we, of course, like all of us, try and produce that good cutting edge research that both is practical and forms policy, governance, and law reform. We, we try and get past the sort of superficial and really look at those root causes. How do we uh, reorient? And when we're talking about ecological pieces, there's a real scale element. So we're looking from the local to the national. And then more broadly, we're looking at all times to find those strategic policy engagement. We play that role of trusted government advisor. We engage in public dialogues through media and public forums. And that's where a lot of our networks and our partners come in. So we don't just uh, sort of stay active at the university, but more broadly and try and engage in a very hands-on practical way by working with our partners directly in place. And an important role there is the convening aspect. And that's a, a big area that Laura spends a lot of the time in our communications element. And she will put in the chat uh, a link to a video where you can get kind of an overview of how Polis operates. But I always like to use the metaphor or the analogy of the iceberg because a lot of our activities, these bullets 
are above surface, but a lot of our impact is actually below surface, that bigger piece where we're trying to influence pieces. The next slide talks a bit about uh, where we sort of come at it because we have some real value add. And that is around our role uh, in moving towards uh, this notion of better governance. And we know in a resource or in a water or community sense that there's a high level of intuitive understanding that it's a mix of expertise and uh, science and traditional knowledge, rules and enforcement play a role. And of course, communities and local control, including planning play a critical aspect. So that's how we uh, uh, come at the governance piece. And it's uh, grounded at the water project in our work around the blueprint for watershed governance, uh, a document that's about 10 years old, but is still relevant as we try and implement that detailed program. And next slide is where I'll hand off and I see Rosie is coming on, but you can see the many big ideas that we both play an intellectual role in trying to drive things like the public trust doctrine, watershed governance, um, things like watershed security, but also a very practical. And when I think about practical, I of course think about Rosie Sims. So I'll pass it off to her now. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, next slide, I guess. And hi, everyone. I don't think I've actually met everyone on the call, but I'm Rosie. I'm a research lead and project manager with Polis. And I just wanted to share, I guess, three spotlights on some of our current priorities that we're working on. This is, of course, a small subset of the larger work of the project, but a big focus for 2022 for our team is to support moving some strong provincial government mandates around water and watershed security into actual action on the ground. And so this is going to involve both policy analysis, but a lot of convening and a lot of working with our network to provide strong direction to government on what these two initiatives, the Watershed Security Strategy and Watershed Security Fund, can and ought to look like in the province. There's an ongoing both research and applied bulk of work around modernized land and watershed planning, and both Oliver and I and our partners play a pretty direct role in some of these regional on-the-ground co-governance initiatives that are trying to do planning in new ways, implement the Water Sustainability Act in new ways, and so we play a very embedded role in the couch and, for instance, supporting some work between couch and tribes in the province there. And then, of course, we have ongoing research themes. These are some of our longer arc projects. And two that I just wanted to highlight today are around watershed security and climate security and an ongoing piece around the role of local governments and watershed governance. So I guess I'll just flag those three initiatives. And there's lots of other webinars and events and convening that I think this community might be interested in as well. And I'll just add one policy tidbit before we hand to uh, Kelly. But when we talk about water policy in Canada and internationally, so the local all the way to the global, we've never in the, as far as I can tell, uh, history had the alignment we currently have between the issues showing up locally. We all live through the droughts and floods where the provincial mandate is very strong around watershed security at national and international. So we're seeing this sort of very interesting convergence around water and watersheds in particular that makes our work very sort of exciting and very, um, um, I don't know, I guess the stakes feel high. And, and so that's part of the, the driving piece when we think about policy windows and alignment. Okay, I think maybe over to me. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, Kelly Bannister here, co-director of Polis Project with Oliver Brandes. And I'm coming to you from a little bit uh, farther north than Victoria. I'm in uh, Coast Salish territory of uh, Halkomenum speaking people um, and the homelands of the Penelicut people. And I live on a tiny island called Thetis Island. So come to you from my little tiny island. It's not my island, but <laughs> I, I love to be here. Um, and so my part of Polis is um, under a different initiative. I like to uh, um, collaborate with the water project as much as possible. And as Oliver said, um, help make the ethical dimensions of the work kind of more um, intentional and more visible. Um, but I work on a different initiative that I call biocultural ethics. And uh, just a snapshot of what that is, I won't get into it at all, but really I'm um, looking at the ethical dimensions of ecological governance and indigenous co-governance. So what does that look like? And essentially like whose values and whose principles, whose 
excuse me, ethics are we actually talking about? And are we uh, intentionally choosing those um, ethics or those ways of, of interacting and treating one another? Are we, are we just assuming them? Are we assuming we all understand what the underlying values and beliefs and principles are that are guiding our work? So a lot of my work is under the mentorship and advice of Indigenous knowledge holders, Indigenous scholars, scholars and colleagues. And the, the work that we tend to do is really take a look at what are the underlying, what is the, the nature, the character, the, the ethos that underlies what we're doing and how we treat one another, not just one another as humans, but um, as um, uh, in terms of our relational or interrelationships with all beings in nature um, and the earth itself and recognizing that we're all connected in this web of life. And, and so um, biocultural ethics is an applied form of relational ethics that's deeply, deeply informed by indigenous understandings and practices and wisdom traditions. Um, and the, the work, I won't get into the, the work itself, but um, the, I, I would say rather than a project, the Bioculture Ethics Initiative is a, is a responsive movement responding constantly to requests for, um, from governments, from um, First Nations organizations or nations themselves, from NGOs, from universities, um, asking how can we do what we're doing in a better way that can um, that can be respectful of the different um, worldviews that are now coming together um, in response to the pressing environmental um, crises and, and, um, and dilemmas that we're facing. So um, I don't know what else I wanted to say, but I think uh, there's no time. So i um, happy to say more down the road in future when there's more time, but just uh, introduce you to this um, often invisible dimension of the work that we do and the, the, the work at Polis, we're trying to um, help make that less invisible, more practical, more useful, and more intentional. Uh, I don't know if there's another slide or if that's the end. Oh, well, um, I guess I'll just end with, um, you know, Polis is all about the people. Um, and so uh, here's our, you know, the one chance we got to get together in person. We just had to take a photo. So um, really, um, uh, all of Polis is, takes a re relational approach. And um, we are so thrilled and inspired and motivated to be working together in this way. And especially across these in these difficult times when we often can't be together for this work that really um, is best done in person. So uh, I, I want to just uh, shout out to the team, uh, both at Polis and CFGS, for just constantly innovating and finding ways for us to really feel that sense of connection, even though we might not be able to be together. And, and certainly Jody's a, a key player in that. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll leave it there. That is the best team picture ever. I love the jazz hands. That's so good. Um, yeah, I know one day we got we were all able to get together. That's so fabulous. Um, but also the other part of um, this, it's really nice is that we can zoom you in from Thetis and you didn't have to make a giant trip over the Malahat today. So there's some there are some good things about that. And I think that kind of leads us into the next person who's um, kind of porting in all the way from Sweden, which is amazing. Um, so Michelle, are you still there? I'm hoping. I am, I am. Yay, yeah. so nice to Yay. see your face. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks Please for Please come in, in and chat, yeah. Yeah, is it okay? I'm gonna switch to sharing my screen. Um, I think you have to stop sharing. I will stop sharing yours by doing that, if that's okay. Um, and hopefully that will work. Um, oh, I'm gonna back up one side and everyone can see that okay. Um, so good, I just, Michelle. yeah, great. Thanks. And just a hello to everybody. For those of you that I, I think there's several of you I haven't met yet because I am um, currently based at Stockholm University, but still leading um, the WIG labs there at the Center for Global Studies and very grateful to have the opportunity to do that. So I'm Michelle Lee Moore. And um, I really just wanted to flag one thing originally, but I've never seen our, I love this program showcase. So I always try to join it and I 
like Martin, I'm always impressed and in awe of all of the work that's going on. Um, but I don't think we've ever run before you know, we're not late, we're not running late. So now I'm gonna try and squeeze in a few extra things too, I can't help it. Um, and I just wanna say thanks to everybody for all the sharing so far. I have had this feeling of both, you know, being completely impressed, but also um, just kind of wondering if you've had more hours in the day than I have during this pandemic, because it's been clearly, um, all of the programs have been so incredibly productive, but it's been really neat to see. So the Water Innovation and Global Governance Lab, the WIG Lab, um, we primarily focus, I mean, I try to um, lead some work that focuses on bringing all three of those pieces together, but quite often there's also separate strands where we're just looking at innovation and transformation and, um, and then, or just governance innovation. And it's not necessarily water, but kind of more writ large across different sectors, but largely trying to bring those pieces together. So what I thought I'd do today is just, share a couple of things that are really, really new. Um, so they're not well formulated, don't have a lot to say about them, but they're in that stage where the more is really the merrier. And so I thought they would be really fun to share with you um, in case you see some links here to work that you're doing or you know others that might wanna be linked in. And so just to showcase it for that purpose. So um, the WIG Lab has a kind of long history, I suppose, since we started at CFGS in 2012, of just sort of exploring different concepts and sort of different frameworks and ideas for thinking about how we build capacity for water governance innovation. Um, and that has moved between watersheds in Canada, um, but also looking elsewhere in the world. And I think we've looked at things like social license to operate and how that emerged in discussions in relation to accountability and transparency, particularly in the mining sector. Um, we've been looking at whether the processes such as consultation, which um, despite it being an instrument of colonial power, whether it still provides some space for social learning, which the research says is, is really important for change and governance innovation processes. Um, we've recently been looking at polycentric governance. You know, is it really about the form that governance takes um, and doing some work on transnational law which uh, Benjamin Perry is leading, as well as Earth System Law, uh, which I've been leading with some colleagues from here at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, and of course, many of you may know Rebecca, who had finished up doing her work, and she was looking around environmental justice pr principles. So that work has kind of always been a part of what we've been doing. I think it will always continue to be there. But one of the things that happened when I walked in the doors um, to Stockholm Resilience Center is there's this whole group that do, I guess, sort of uh, yeah, Anthropocene dynamic modeling, for lack of a better word, um, global earth systems modeling, hydro global hydrological systems modeling. And so I spent some time going to various talks and hearing about their work. And every time I did, I kind of, you know, it's this whole different world. I'm, I'm not a modeler. Um, so it's taken me a long time to understand it. But every time I did, I've been blown away by how much um, the advances that they're making are really changing the very basics of how I've understood a hydro hydrological system work that we've all learned back in sort of elementary school. Um, and I realized maybe I've been teaching it quite wrong based on what we're starting to learn. But what also struck me was there's this huge gap between that those advances and what sort of mainstream discourse around governance is considering to be important in the water discussions. And so I've been trying to think about um, you know, how do we start bringing these different water worlds together in some ways, very kind of technical um, with the governance. And um, so I started convening different meetings, just again, trying to like learn this world and start figuring out what questions can we even ask. And then in late August, Nature Sustainability, uh, their editorial team published an editorial saying, you know, basically, the extremes of water have got all the attention and water has been cranking out a bunch of studies, but they're all basically the same and they're not advancing anything, um, which several of us had some reactions to. We really felt like they forgot the entire field of, say, social science. Um, it was quite biased towards the natural sciences, never mind other completely other knowledge systems, including indigenous ways of knowing African knowledge systems. So uh, several of us then did get mobilized to try and respond to this, I think in, in part, partly the responses, but now I'm leading this effort to try to really do this massive synthesis on what we understand about um, kind of global water governance as well as these global water systems and modeling. So if anyone, again, the more the merrier, if anyone's interested, please come join, uh, just let me know, um, it's, it's early days. 
a lot of the other work I do is around transformative capacity, capacities for innovation, but also about how do you convene um, and create space for yeah, different kinds of conversations, different questions to emerge. What are the design principles behind that? Um, knowledge co-production principles, things like that. So I spent a lot of time kind of trying to advance both the scholarship in that area, but actually also doing that work in practice. Um, so I've been part of leading a number of different transdisciplinary, I suppose, education programs using that term, but kind of also like a space for really applying what we're understanding about complex systems change, about governance innovation in, in real time. Um, the one that is currently ongoing is called Catalyzing Change. It is funded by the Swedish Institute. It's in partnership uh, with three different organizations based in South Africa, um, the South Africa Food Lab, ADAPT South Africa and Community Test, and um, as well as the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center. And this, uh, we're just going into our current, our second cohort right now, next week, actually, we'll be having one of our online modules. And um, it's focused on the 16 countries that make up the Southern African development community. And it's about strengthening public sector innovation capacity. Um, so I'm honored to be, to be part of that team and, and um, to be engaging in that space. And my other new one is, um, the CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, and the Swedish Institute, and another organization called Vinova, which is sort of a, a kind of innovation, science innovation group. They've all partnered together to um, uh, fund a new kind of transdisciplinary program, and they're just kind of very vague in what they want, but we're putting forward a, an idea to really kind of focus on this idea of transformations. Um, and again, it's a, a partner with the same team with our, our kind of South African and Swedish counterparts. So um, that one's kind of up and coming and fingers crossed, if we get that funding, I'll be putting a call out to all of you, which is why I wanted to mention it for nominees and possibly for partnering in, in different kind of pieces of, of both content, but also the processes of how we design these kinds of spaces. So stay tuned. Um, last thing that I want to mention before my last last thing um, is this identifying transformative potential is another piece of work. All of this focus on the innovation and transformative impact. The big question is, is how do you know, you know, ahead of time what to really sort of spend your energy and effort and resources on and will it be transformative or not? Or worse, does it actually strengthen or reproduce some of the problems of the existing system? So um, we've been doing a lot of work trying to figure out how we can um, identify that. Can we find certain signals for that? Um, and there's two pieces of work I just wanted to highlight here. One is based on a project called the Seeds of a Good Anthropocene. Some of you may have heard of this. There's a hub for it in Canada. It wasn't part of the original founding of this project, but there's a hub in Montreal, um, one in South Africa and one in, in Stockholm. And I've been um, just joining in now where um, with the Canadian hub and Elena Bennett uh, is leading this work from, from McGill University. Um, and we're exploring the role of narratives in the kind of tensions and collaborations among different seed initiatives because of course, inevitably transformation isn't going to just come from one specific innovation or one in innovative initiative, but it will be multiple seeds and pathways um, that create these different kinds of futures. So we're doing some work there that I think sounds like we have some links across different projects and interests and narratives. Um, and then this last piece is under um, a large program called the Global Resilience Partnership. Originally, when I came to, to the Stockholm Resilience Center, what I came for was to support a program um, that was serving as a knowledge partner to this Global Resilience Partnership. Since that time, that program, um, that piece came to an end and the Global Resilience Partnership Secretariat now sits at Stockholm University. Um, and under that, there's a program looking at this, this idea of seeds. So can you identify sort of, I guess, pockets of the future in the present? Can we find these little seeds that, that can grow and, and more importantly, be connected with one another? Um, and a number of organizations working in the humanitarian sector um, and in conflict zones, including Red Cross and Care International and others, had asked us to kind of think about how that would work in those contexts. So we have a new program called Seeds of Resilience for Peace, um, where again, we're trying to apply, I'm the contribution I'm making, at least is trying to think about how do we apply these ideas around transformative potential. So that's not water specific, but that's one of those pieces that's just looking at that innovation and transformation piece. Last thing, uh, which is where I'm hoping, um, I think, 
uh, yeah, I guess maybe it's a, a plea for support, <laughs> if I can, if I may, but I just want to do a really quick introduction to Abdul Tawab Balakarzai. Um, this is a really cool story that has come full circle to Center for Global Studies way back when um, a woman named Jenny Hill used to work for the Center for Global Studies. I think she was like a work study student, um, probably back in the early mid 2000s. Um, she is now currently, or when we reconnected back in the spring, she was the Canadian ambassador to South Sudan. She's now stationed as the Canadian ambassador in Namibia. Um, and she had uh, a friend of hers from, she used to work for Canadian CEDA, uh, which no longer exists, but um, so she was in sta stationed in Afghanistan for many years. And she had a friend there who was interested in doing his PhD in water governance. So she had connected us back last spring. Um, so we had started brainstorming and we developed a proposal. He had developed a proposal and, and then we thought about trying to find some funds over the next year. Um, and then as you are all very aware, I'm sure, Things took a real turn um, quite quickly in Afghanistan, and um, suddenly our time frame for when it made sense to perhaps start his PhD changed. Um, he has been, Balkarzai was accepted under the Special Immigration Program uh, in Canada. He managed to get himself and eight of his uh, family members out. So there are nine of them. They made it to Islamabad um, about a month ago and, and actually just arrived um, in Canada, I think three days ago, um, safely. So we're very, very, very thrilled about that. Um, unbeknownst, no one can figure out yet why he has been moved. He landed in Toronto. He's been moved to Brandon, Manitoba. It's not clear yet whether that was a mistake um, from the government program or whether they had run out of quarantine capacity in Toronto, um, and that this is actually just a step in the resettlement process. Um, anyways, it's very confusing, and we are not clear when he will actually arrive in Victoria. It may take a lot longer if it was a mistake and they need to sort that out. If it was actually intentional and just for quarantine purposes, hopefully he'll be moving on. But he will be joining, he was accepted to start at the beginning of January um, in the Department of Geography. He is going to be co-supervised by Chris uh, Dombrowski, who was kind enough to come forward with some funding support for the first year. Um, so we'll be doing some work on water governance systems in, in Afghanistan um, and also looking at um, nature-based solutions as well. Um, so I put out a personal appeal in the sense of I, you know, there couldn't be a worse situation in terms of how you start your PhD. Um, and I, as you know, one of the co-supervisors, I'm not even in the country, I was hoping to at least be there to welcome him when he arrived. I, because of the variant, I couldn't be. Um, and again, because of quarantine, it's not clear when, when they'll be there anyways. Um, so uh, yeah, we only have funding support for one year, um, but it was, you know, kind of the best of a bad set of <laughs> choices to make. Um, and we're glad he's safe. But I'm, I'm, every time I sort to start to feel panicky about it all, I remember he's at CFDS, he's going to be okay. Um, I know there's a wonderful community who will be interested in hearing. I'm, I'm sure we'll want to get him to do a global talk soon to hear about his both his personal and his professional journey in Afghanistan's development. Um, and last thing I didn't mention, he, I found out along the way, um, he didn't want to just do his PhD. He has actually been... Um, He's a faculty member at Kabul University. He was the chancellor at Kandahar University, and he is the was the deputy minister of education, um, and of course was a big part of leading the push for um, getting uh, access for uh, women in education. So it became um, very early a, a target. So um, again, we're really glad he's safe. He has far more experience than probably the average PhD candidate starting, um, but I know will be a huge asset to CFGS. And I, I hope in my absence, you'll welcome him with open arms. Thanks. Or is I, you'll oh, welcome just, him. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just want to say one last thing was a huge thanks to um, Jody and Martin specifically you provided a lot of support in those early moments when I was just trying to figure out how can we support them and you gave me a lot of recommendations of people to contact and they were all incredibly helpful so also again so thanks to CFGS for the support. Very welcome that's sometimes you get reminded that one small thing you do has a giant impact on someone's life I can't believe he's actually here that's amazing Michelle that's just Kind of mind blowing, and then you also see those stories of all those people, and then you know, then all of a sudden somebody lands on your doorstep, which is 
Yeah, and I'm sure he'll have a huge impact for the research community here too and the people around him. Thank you for bringing him to us too. Yeah, great. Um, one of the things I hear, you know, if we did one of those wordles is that um, there's so much that diversity in our community of global researchers and all the projects that we do, but there's a lot of synergies on the, um, the doing, the impacting, the participating in the community, the collaborations. And um, I'm just really grateful that you all spent time today just to sort of bring that to each other. I used to say that it was a great way for um, us to be briefed on um, on just what's going on. But I, and, and because normally um, I know so much about everybody's research, but I haven't been able to, I can't tell everybody that's in the halls that. And what I'm learning today is that these networks have grown so much that um, seeing your slides and hearing the impact you're having around the world is just, it's amazing just so the, that a little center can can just have that that far reach. So thank you all for, for participating in that. And then I'm just gonna do one thing because I'm um, sitting in the chair spot before I hand it over to Martin to um, facilitate any questions for everybody. I just want to put uh, Kristen Brandel on, on the spot for a quick second just to introduce yourself to our community if we were sitting around on a table we would it would feel a little, a little less formal but um it would really be great to have to hear a bit what you're doing Kristen, because um you're coming in on a uh, faculty research fellowship so welcome welcome yeah thank you jody and i have to say i'm really impressed this has been a great session for me to learn a little bit about all of these projects at the center and i'm really i mean really impressed um, and quite looking forward to know more about the different uh, projects and uh, talking to different um, individuals as well. And hopefully we get back to the university soon and we can actually engage a little bit more. Um, as Jody said, I'm a faculty fellow. Um, I come from the business school. Um, I applied with a project together with my colleague Elizabeth Moore from Northeastern University, and she will be coming to Victoria towards the end of the term. With the COVID regulation, it was a little difficult. She had some commitment she had to take care of at Northeastern as well. And we are working together on a project on intergovernmental organizations, predominantly the United Nations Council for Trade and Development. And uh, we're working together with them on um, a research which identifies, we called it institutional schisms, like a misalignment of regulations and policies of these intergovernmental organizations and national governmental policies and regulations. So it's a little bit more abstract on the, I say maybe the political science and economic level on a more broader field, but um, we'll take this down to the business implications and how has that impacted maybe um, trade between different countries and business activities. Particularly, it's not as big and grand as all of the other projects I've just heard. So it feel, feels a little bit anticlimactic, but um, but I'm quite looking forward to get to know more about the different, yeah, um, um, projects and maybe there, there there could be some interaction as well. I can see that a lot of United Nations activities as well, which is great. So maybe we can collaborate and share knowledge and um, insights there too. So thank you, Jody, for. Let me introduce myself for a bit and it's big and grand enough for us kirsten yeah. thank you very much <laughs> over to you martin okay thank you all wow thank you thank you everybody thank you everybody for uh sharing this time together and uh wow right congratulations on all of your achievements uh it's so exciting to see how these projects um all of the achievements of the projects how they evolve over the years uh thanks so much to jody and kayla for um seeing us uh, through all those slides and organizing it all. Um, uh, what This has just been a, a great time together. I mean, I do so regret that we're not together in a seminar room. Um, having said that, as Jody mentioned, Zoom, I mean, Michelle, how great to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. So thanks maybe to Zoom for that too, uh, for what it's worth. Um, Kristen, welcome. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, very much looking forward to um, uh, meeting you and spending more time with you and learning more about your work. And uh, it's a reminder, isn't it, that in addition to all of what the projects can achieve and contribute to the center and all of those synergies that Jody was talking about, you know, um, uh, wait, but wait, there's more, right? We have student fellows and we have faculty fellows and we have associate fellows and all of their projects as well. So um, uh, Project Showcase is really just uh, is really to promote the projects, 